begin. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending where you are uh, on the globe. Our Princeton Bucharest seminar tonight is meeting 52, apparently. And the title of the panel is Geometry in the 18th Century, Philosophical Arguments and Epistemological Assumptions. We will have three speakers and we will have uh, questions and answers after each talk. Please do make a sign uh, or write down your question that would be ideal to write a bit about your question in the chat so that I can uh, follow and, and react quickly in the limited time for the questions and answers. Our first, and, and maybe I should also say that uh, Daniel Garber is sending his uh, excuses for not being able to be uh, with us tonight. He uh, has some medical problems, but I'm sure he will watch us on YouTube at some point or another. Um, our first speaker tonight is Jens Lemanski, and the talk is The Crisis of Intuition in the 18th Century. Jens, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. I share my screen one moment. So now you should see the presentation. Well, um, we have three lectures today, just to say, we we'll start with a debate here about um, rationalism and empiricism from the 1720s, uh, then uh, Theodore Berwe will present Lambert's uh, theory of parallel lines from the mid 18th century, and finally Andrea Reichenberger will give us an insight into the debate between Kant and Kästner from the 1790s, especially focusing on uh, the notion of uh, possibility. So uh, I will start here with uh, the lecture, the crisis of intuition from uh, the 18th or in the 18th century. That is a debate between uh, Kerber and Hoheisel and. Well, to my uh, knowledge, there is no literature on that debate uh, in the moment between the empiricist uh, Hoheisel and the rationalist Kerber, uh, at least no literature that is younger than 100 years old. Well, and I've come uh, across the names Kerber and Hoheiser several times in my study of um, um, texts from the 18th uh, and 19th century. And a crisis of intuition, as you see here in my title, refers uh, to the German title here, Krise der Anschauung, uh, coming from Hans Hahn from the Vienna Circle and later taken up by a Volkart in a book uh, entitled Krise der Anschauung, and um, actually this crisis here refers to a debate from the 1880s uh, in which the axiomatization of uh, mathematics pushed back the role of intuition, so to say. Well, the crises are always about the status um, of descriptive, intuitive, pictorial or figurative uh, knowledge or cognition we have here. And in short, the, the question could be uh, raised in, in this time of, of crisis. What is the role of diagrams, of drawings, of uh, geometric shapes, and so on? So, well, um, in my current book uh, entitled World and Logic, I've argued, among other things, that there are several crises of intuition which have occurred roughly every 80 or 100 years since at least uh, it's the latest since the 17th century and uh, they also concern not not only geometry but also for example the application of a geometry um, by a logic diagrams so something uh, you see here on the screen and um, well um, you can also see this periods of crisis here given in that timeline and I fear just put in some representative authors or schools as placeholders so so to say and in most cases there are high phases and depressions um, so high phases of intuition here uh, marked here in orange, uh, for example, um, but uh, there are also some some other periods in which uh, more 
um, well, something contra-intuition prevails, so to say, depending on whether a school that is either pro or a contra-intuition wins the debate between or in this time of the crisis. Well, and you can also say that there's something like a role of, of thumb. Uh, so again and again, there are rationalists or logicists who deny the value of intuitive knowledge. And there are, on the other hand, uh, empiricists or transcendental philosophers or phenomenologists who drew attention to the value of, um, of figures, of diagrams, of intuition in general. Um, well, and as you can see uh, here, for example, from the diagrams conference in the moment, um, as an example, there's nowadays a large community of uh, philosophers, of mathematicians, psychologists, historians, and so on, who are again intensively engaged in diagrams, uh, but you can say as, as recently as the middle of the 20th century, this was highly imaginable in many disciplines, so to say. So what I'm mainly interested here are the arguments coming from these times of crisis uh, I marked before in the timeline. And uh, since I'm not found any current literature on the debate uh, of the 1720s dispute, I'm now uh, trying to present an overview of that. So normally, or um, we have to start here presenting the position of Leibniz and Wolf. Uh, uh, in detail, but I think or I hope that these positions are well known and therefore I, I skip that here. I only remind that there are many critiques of Leibniz and Wolf already in the 18th century and that uh, criticism uh, extended strongly to the field or to the discipline of, of mathematics in, in the 1720s. So you can see here also in the timeline as before, the more empiricist authors um, arguing pro-intuition here above and uh, marked here in, in orange or the one in green and uh, below are the more rationalist authors here given in blue. And um, one of the strongest uh, representatives within this debate here is Andreas Rüdiger, who published a lot of books concerning logic and mathematics up to the 1720s. I just took here one book as uh, an example here. And in the first half of the, the 20s, there's a debate, especially between Tilesius and Popo here uh, about intuition in mathematics, on which there's already a little bit of research, so to say, and to that extent, I am omitting details here and I focus mainly on the later debate here starting in 26. So. Here in 26, we have um, the book De Methodo Mathematica published by Johann Konrad Feuerlein, who was a student of Erd Weigel. And then in 26, uh, we have the book De Ideas. That is the one which reignites the whole debate uh, on intuition in mathematics, especially we can say because of the harsh wording of Hohe Heisel we have here. And uh, in the late 26, we have here an anonymous review from the Deutsche Akta Eruditorum, issue 122, uh, in which particular the position of Hoheiser, but also indirectly the position of Rüdiger here is strongly attacked. Well, this is supported also by Friedrich Schlosser uh, in the Dissertatio Epistolica at Hoheiselium, and then in 27, we have Hoheisel again. He defends his position in a book uh, entitled Ungrund der Einwürfe, uh, especially against this anonymous reviewer here. Uh, and then in 29, we have here Hoffmann publishing, uh, published a, a book, uh, Wolfen's uh, Logic, and Tranquilius here with the book Spitzimina Logica Heroica, in which only well, one particular issue of Wolf's logic is, is here criticized. So therefore, that doesn't really matter. Well, but then we have um, uh, Kerber here. He drew a line under the whole debate in his book Archimedes Defensus in 31. And the debate was slowly then lost or shifted to other areas outside of mathematics. And I think that most authors of the late 20s debate here are known. That is a, a whole to say that is a typical um, debate here in, um, in German speaking German, uh, journals and, and uh, books we, we have here. 
Well, let's come to some of the empiricist arguments. And uh, I would, of course, I can only uh, present here a few selected arguments from the whole controversy and cannot claim here to be uh, complete. But the first book I picked out was here by Andreas Rüdiger, De Senso Veri et Falsi, in the edition of 22. Um, and to give a short summary, one can say that Rüdiger claims that humans have um, deficient uh, knowledge due to, due to the fall of Adam and uh, rationalism must fail, he says, because uh, all innate ideas, everything in us is sin sinful. Uh, well, he also claims that pure empiricism is also problematic, but uh, ideas originate from his view, from experience, um, but must then be rationally clarified. Uh, so that is a mixed position, so to say, with uh, a strong emphasis on empiricism. Well, and he says we have two disciplines which are really important. The one here is ethics and logic, on the other hand, and they have a special function. They can help uh, humans to get out of the state of the fall. Uh, because logic is applicable to all sciences, but he said it shouldn't be contaminated by, by mathematics because mathematics has a, pro a problem with, with uh, uh, inferential status. Um, is he, uh, in his opinion, arithmetic is merely counting central, mental, or possible details, and therefore it cannot generate new information as, for example, logic can. Well, uh, that mathematics is also not a suitable tool to generate new information as logic can. And, um, and, and uh, therefore the mathematization um, of, of logic or philosophy as Rüdiger sees it in Wolf must therefore fail. But what does Rüdiger now say about intuition in, in, uh, in mathematics? Well, let's have a look at the following quote. He uh, said here, for example, uh, thus, for example, when, when uh, some mathematicians here demonstrate that uh, three uh, angles of a triangle are equal to two uh, right triangles, um, they do not do so by using ideas or by syllogisms, but by figures, because here yeah, the truth of what is asserted, um, these fundaments are given here in what he calls uh, sensualibus circumstances by, by something like uh, sensory circumstances and, and so on. Of course, there are other kinds of reasoning, as you see here, the ideal one or the verbal one, but uh, the first one, that is the one which is applicable to geometry, especially or to mathematics. Well, then we have uh, the next book from the empiricist that here is uh, coming from uh, Tilesius. And uh, he reinforces this, this empiricist reference in using, um, in using uh, the famous Lockean or peripatetic axiom, as you see here in the quote, so that nothing is in uh, the intellect. Uh, that was not uh, first in, in the census here. He also refers in uh, that position to Rüdiger, to Locke, so to say. And uh, that was also taken then up in the late 20s by Hoheiser in the book you see here, De Ideis. And that was a book that was criticized the most in the debate of the late 20s. So, well, we can say following Rüdiger and Tilesius, uh, also for Hoheisel, there is the axiom that Neil is in intellectual court, not for it in sensus, so to say. And um, that is, in his view, that is universally valid, uh, but this axiom cannot be proven a priori. Uh, it can also, you can also try to, to falsify it or to demand counter evidence. And he said, well, there are two popular counter proofs against this axiom. The one is coming from uh, Gottlieb Gerhard Titius from uh, As Cogitandi. We ignore that. But the other one that is coming from mathematics. Uh, well, but in his view, all mathematics uh, is um, that are ideas on uh, either numbers or uh, of figures. And now here, that is the most prominent quote um, in that time 
from um, from from Hoheisel here, um, he says something like, "Well, the uh, the discovery here of some algebraic uh, truths." Um, also sometimes uh, proceeds here with the aid of or without the aid of uh, the algebra um, by only using the senses here solo sensu um uso um, as it can be uh, it can be helped to illustrate that by some example well he said that's the the, prop the proportion or the, the ratio between the cylinder and the globe uh, when uh, when the base and the height of both are the same as given by Archimedes and so on, that can be investigated solo oculorum uso only by using our eye, so to say. And if you take care here of, of a cylinder and the globe of ivory, for example, you can also examine the, the weight of both here on the scale and uh, just using your senses. Well, that was... Pardon. That was here the prominent quote uh, coming from Hoheiser. And now let's come uh, and see what are the rationalist arguments in that debate. And the first one here is coming, as I said before, from the Deutsche Akte Eruditorum by an anonymous reviewer. And this reviewer criticizes, among other things, First, that one cannot construct from an example or from, from a figure or from intuition, but only, and that is a Wolfian position, only from definitions, from axioms, from rules, and so on. And he also states, well, that one cannot reduce algebra to intuition, that one cannot claim such uh, those things as mentioned here in, in, um, in Hoheisel. Um, the one who does that has an understand Wolf, and so on, and uh, the whole interpretation here of the cylinder to the globe, as you see here, that is misleading in Hoheiser. Well, um, we have also here then the position of Schlosser in the Dissertatio Epistolica et Hoheiselium here, and he makes he makes some fun of Hoheisel's idea that we uh, should work with intuition and not with def definitions in mathematics. Well, he, uh, he said that um, if, if uh, we really would use our senses in order to get mathematical objects, well, then our circles would have the shape like apples or like cherries, or our lines would like, like uh, tree trunks or elephant trunks like that. And that is, of course, not, not the case. And therefore, uh, it, is, it is wrong to have this empiricist view on mathematics. Well, and then the most mature um, criticism from the rationalists is then offered by Kerber in a book with a very baroque title, as you can see here, um, that is, uh, but it gives a very good insight uh, on the content, that here is Archimedes' defense, that is the fundamental proof that the theoremata of Archimedes, uh, Archimedes uh, concerning uh, the relation between uh, the, the um, sphere to the cylinder uh, cannot be proven here solo or colorum uso, as some authors mean. That here is the first proof that mathematics is not based on the senses, that abstraction has to fail, and everything he, uh, those, those uh, authors, the empiricist authors claim, that is what is given here in Rüdiger and in Hoheisen. So that is a direct um, attack on Rüdiger and Hoheisen, so to say. Well, um, this book um, written in 31 uh, that gives at first, um, similar to Feuerlein before, and that gives a history of the debate that goes far back to the 16th century. And uh, he then argues that it is impossible for our eyes to perceive the size of the sphere or of a cylinder, as it is uh, impossible for our hands, so to say, to determine the gravity of, of uh, some, some objects that cannot claim. But then um, he said also, well, um, at first, our hands cannot draw as accurately as the definition of geometry are given in, in uh, uh, a verbal manner. And he also says uh, here in paragraph uh, uh, 10 here, but if we cannot infer uh, from the, the truth from the sensual experience here, 
That doesn't mean that we in turn cannot infer the sensory experience from the truth. So that is a kind of choosing a new direction here, the rationalist direction here coming from definitions, from axioms, from theorems and so on. And he tries to show that by using some example here of Archimedes, you see here also in German Kugel and Cylinder, uh, that is also the, the same debate referring to the paragraph we saw before in Hoheisen. Well, let's come to the outlook. Yeah, um, of course, we can say Hoheisel did not agree with the criticism of the anonymous reviewer. Not, uh, not, um, it doesn't agree with Schlosser, with Kerber, and so on. He stated several times uh, that he wanted to answer uh, in detail and to refute the rationalist, but well, to my present knowledge, um, this hasn't happened. He just announced that. And in principle, one can say that the Wolfians here won the debate. At least that is uh, what was quickly portrayed here in some textbooks and historiographies from the 18th century. Well, um, in principle, we can say that we have here, um, that we have here two general positions, uh, so to say, the empiricists claim that everything here is based on uh, perception and sensuality diagrams, figures, pictures, um, uh, and so on in mathematics are a representation of what is sensually per perceived. Well, and the rationalists argued that all mathematics uh, or ma all mathematical objects here can be defined without reference to sensuality and mathematics is uh, therefore only based on rules, on axioms and so on. Well, it's interesting, uh, I think, to know that in the 20s here, we have a debate uh, in which Archimedes is the main point of contention. But in the 90s, uh, in the 1790s, and also here in the later debate um, in the 1880s, it is Euclid. Yeah? And it is interesting uh, also to know that in the 20s here, the empiricists had the defense against rapidly dominating empiricists, while in the 90s, it was the rationalists who had to defend themselves against this uh, quickly uh, more and more dominant Kantians uh, coming up. So, well, but in all the debates we have then, we have many aftermaths in the German speaking world. So echoes can still be found in later debates up to the 19th century. You can see here from, uh, for example, here uh, from a quote by Kestner and also later by Klügel in the debate of uh, the 1790s that they refer uh, exactly to the book here of Kerber, Archimedes Defensors, in 1731, uh, here referring also to Rüdiger and Hoheiser that they are the, the both who didn't, didn't win this uh, debate, so to say. And uh, that is what Kestner here wrote uh, against and against Kant. So uh, nothing new in Kant, everything here is discussed already in the debate of the 1720s. Um, Therefore, one can say that the 1720s debate seems to form something like an, uh, I would say, an important argumentative basis for a much more, of a much, many much more differentiated debate in the later crises we have. Well, and uh, as I, I try to show uh, on different kinds of levels, uh, for example, in logic diagrams and so on, in, in the current book, um, there are still traces in current debates referring to the same arguments we have uh, seen here before. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Very well timed. We have time for questions. Please either raise your hand or signal in the chat. Aaron Wells. Yeah, th thanks for the talk. Um, this, this may just be a point of clarification, but at the end of the talk, you said that the ration, what you're calling the rationalist right. position is one where mathematical proofs are only based on non-intuitive involving uh, principles or axioms that are purely discursive. 
So I just wasn't sure whether that was the position of the people you were summarizing. It seemed like they were mostly arguing against an extreme opposing view on which one could have a proof solely by perceptual inspection. Right. But saying that you can't have a proof solely by perceptual inspection doesn't mean that there's no role for intuition and that it's right. all logical and all axioms. But I mean, I haven't read these texts. So you, you, is there evidence that they're committed to such a strong sort of logicist view? Right. Um, in, in detail, one can say that there is, of course, a role of intuition in the people who are arguing contra intuition or uh, um, arguing here contra uh, the empiricist view on mathematics. But I just try to uh, keep a more general view on both and not having in view the more detailed debates about what the special kind of intuition might be from a non-empiricist kind of, of uh, reasoning, so to say. Of course, in we, we can also say that some of the empirists are also uh, claim, well, uh, it's okay in, in some cases to work with rules or with axioms and so on. Uh, but uh, I would say that are for example, I, I give this this view by uh, Tranquilius. That is a, a book uh, which is more detailed uh, on the debate than uh, what I what I showed before. I just try to well illustrate the whole debate as very extreme position, so to say. I hope that clarifies in detail. Of course, uh, a lot of of, uh, of 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 more minor arguments. Uh, uh, saying maybe sometimes something different. That's one. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, I was hoping you would say a little bit more about Rudiger because um, yeah. we know that Kant knew something about him because he's mentioned in the Herder lecture notes. Right. Um, so there was a debate. Uh, there was, a, there is a big debate, as you know, about, about Kant's own philosophy of mathematics and what is the meaning of his doctrine of the indispensability of intuition right. in mathematical proof. And on the one side, you have people like Russell and, and Friedman, who say that this arises from uh, insight into the proof theoretic limitations of Euclid of of, um, of Kantian Aristotelian syllogistic. Right. And then on the other side, in the German literature, uh, literature, you've got Poriaco, who wrote a book about this. And he said, actually, no, it's kind of a repetition of a Lockean theme, according to which um, what logic might achieve in mathematics is already, al is already achieved by inspection of the figure. So uh, yeah. the syllogism is superfluous. It wouldn't add anything. Now, so Coriaco then attributes to Kant the, 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 the he doesn't say it's a mistaken inference, but it's obviously a mistaken inference. Basically, Kant confused the doctrine of um, the super, superfluity of, of, um, of logic in mathematics with the indispensability of intuition. These are two very different doctrines, but they're blurred together in Coriaco. Um, but uh, the, basic, the basic idea is that there's a much stronger Lockean influence there in the Kantian you and as I understand it, there is a strong Lockean influence in Rudiger. And Rudiger is used in Locke to respond to the Wolfians and so on. Do you see anything there that sheds any new light on this kind of debate about what's going on? Well, um, I'm, I'm, I must confess that I'm not really searching for a new light on the debate, but more on how the arguments uh, are, um, repeat themselves in, in, the, in these times of crisis. So that is more something I'm interested in, so to say. But well, I must say, uh, as I came across all these authors and read them, I must say that I was mainly not impressed by Rudiger. Well, that's also very interesting, so to say, but a lot of uh, text so to read but uh, what I liked most so to say was Tilesius. Uh, he seems to be have uh, sim something like a Kantian position uh, because he differentiated be, uh, between the empirist view, uh, so so to say, he agrees that everything is uh, uh, starts with with central experience. And that sounds a little bit then like Kant did in the critique of pure reason, but he said that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, um, 
the, when it starts with central experience, that doesn't mean that everything rests on that. So um, there is this, this famous quo, uh, quote uh, of, of uh, Kant in the beginning of, um, of the, um, the introduction of the critique of pure reasoning, uh, which has the differentiation coming from and uh, being within uh, um, central experience. And that seems very similar for me uh, to Tilesius. More, uh, Kant seems to be more uh, or closer for me to Tilesius than to Rudiger. But that is my impression in the moment. I, I hope that helps a little bit. Vincenzo <laughs> Delisi. Uh, so the, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really uh, it was really wonderful. I, I, I didn't know many of these people. I, I think there is a lot of work to do here and very interesting work. So thank you. And 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 so my question is is whether again on intuition that is whether uh, uh, some of these people discuss the status of our axioms in relation to intuition, because it, it, it seems to me that one of the main points of the Wolfian tradition or, or the rationalist tradition in general was that not even axioms should be grounded on intuition, but rather on some kind of logical deduction from definitions. Right. Right. Uh, is, is this discussed at, at some point? Would, would you say that the empiricists were insisting on, on grounding axioms on intuition in particular, or, or there were some, I mean, some debates on, 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 on axioms and, and whether the idea that will be Lambert's idea at some point that uh, you have intuition for axioms and nothing more uh, comes out at some point. Yes. Well, I remember this view from the 1790s debate. Uh, a lot of you saying, uh, for for example, uh, that the axioms uh, that is the only one which just rests on intuition. So, what is the point? What is the line? And so on. That is something we can imagine or what we can see. Well, but um, I would say the strongest or the most extreme Wolfian position we see here, they would deny this position. Uh, that is. Uh, at least my, my impression in the moment, they would say, no, that are innate ideas uh, that has nothing to do with intuition between, because most people in that time understand intuition, as you see by this quote, solo ocolorum uso, really as intuition by senses. So not intuition, for example, by possible or imaginable uh, objects or something like that. And therefore, I would say there are this position, but they seems not to be strong as you have found them in the 1790s. Debate. There is often referred to the case axioms, maybe something which uh, have a reference to intuition. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that helps. Well, uh, if there are no other questions at this moment, then I propose we join in thanking Jens and moving. Thank you. And we move forward to our next uh, so speaker. We are, we are going now here in that area, so to say. Um, our next speaker tonight is Theodor Berve uh, with a talk entitled Beyond the Borders of Actual Thinking and that on Symbolic Knowledge. Theodor, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Let me just share my screen and open my slides. I hope you can hear and see me well. Yes, everything is wonderful. Possible. Let's start from the beginning. Oh, come on. All right. Um, my part of our panel is about Johann Heinrich Lambert as um, Jens already said, um, who takes an interesting intermediate position, I would say, between the empiricist side and uh, the rationalist side, um, if you want to apply this distinction. Um, and my talk is um, especially about the power of symbolic knowledge. Um, it allows us, as Lambert writes a letter to Kant, and this is uh, where I draw my um, my title from, to extend ourselves far beyond the borders of our actual thinking. Now, I would like to start my talk with a brief look at its end, um, namely with a look at Lambert's uh, theory of parallel lines, um, which he wrote in 
the six, but um, which was only published after his death in 1786. Here Lambert tries to prove the parallel axiom um, via a proof of contradiction similar to uh, Sakeri's uh, half a century earlier. He develops three different hypotheses, um, one of which co corresponds to the uh, Euclidean geometry, the other two to a hyperbolic um, and spherical geometry, respectively. He then tries to um, derive contradictions from the second and the third um, hypothesis in order to um, uh, refute um, these hypotheses and prove the Euclidean one. Before that, uh, Lambert um, makes some interesting methodological um, um, points um, about two different methods of proceeding in geometry. Um, on the one hand, we have Euclid's method, um, which refers, according to Lambert, to the representation of the thing itself. Um, and in this way, uh, again, according to Lambert, Euclid's treatment of the parallel axiom is fully justified. Lambert's own proof, on the other hand, is um, purely um, symbolical. Um, to give you Lambert's uh, words. Um, and since Euclid's postulates and other axioms have been expressed in words, it can and sh it should be demanded that the proof never appeals to the thing itself. That would be Euclid's way, um, but that the proof should be carried out purely symbolically when it is possible. In this respect, Euclid's postulates are, as it were, like so many algebraic equations, which one already has in front of oneself and from which one is to compute x, y, z, etc., without looking back to the thing itself. So let's now have a short look at the parallel, uh, at the theory of parallel lines. What do we expect from a symbolic proof? Certainly a lot of algebraic uh, formulas after um, Lambert's introduction here. Um, but as you see, that is not <laughs> entirely the case. Um, what we get is quite different, um, and it is not unlike um, the sections in which Lambert uh, reconstructs Euclid, um, we get diagrams. And that um, gives rise to the question whether perhaps our own intuition of what symbolic means um, is not in line with, with Lambert's understanding. In my talk, I now want to argue that um, symbolic for Lambert does not necessarily mean algebraic, that would be too strict, but uh, should be understood um, yeah, much more broadly. Um, and with this comparison between two methods of proceeding in geometry, uh, Lambert draws on a distinction that was common at the time, namely the distinction between intuitive and um, symbolic knowledge. Um, symbolic here then um, is more or less a technical term with an established meaning for Lambert. I will proceed in three steps. Um, first, I will trace back the historical roots um, very, very briefly. Um, that means I will talk about Leibniz and Wolf. Um, second, I will um, present Lambert's um, account of symbolic knowledge in his philosophical writings. And finally, I will um, shortly come back to the theory of um, parallel lines. First, Leibniz. Um, the defining starting point um, for the development of um, this form of symbolic knowledge uh, is um, a short text by Leibniz published in 6084 in the Acta Eruditorum um, with the title Meditationes de Cognitione Veritate et Ideis. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the text, so I will just uh, give a very short overview. Um, in this text, Leibniz uh, develops a system of um, levels of different levels of knowledge in order to, to improve on the um, Cartesian um, account. And for this purpose, he introduces four different dichotomies, obscura et clara, confusa et distincta, inadequata, adequata, and uh, symbolica intuitiva. Um, for our topic, um, obviously, the last one is most important, the distinction between um, uh, symbolic knowledge and intuitive knowledge. Um, knowledge in which all components of um, a distinct concept are simultaneously present, Leibniz calls intuitive. Um, this is um, basically not, not achievable for mere um, mortals like, like humans. It is uh, only available um, to God basically with the exception of uh, simple um, 
concepts uh, one could add. Um, humans instead have to rely on signs or symbols um, that function as placeholders, so to speak, for complex concepts. Um, and the example Leibniz um, provides is the famous Chiliagon that is uh, present all over the history of um, uh, mathematics or in the philosophy of mathematics. Um, Leibniz writes, um, we do not have to represent all the components of the concept of the Chiliagon simultaneously in order to operate with it. Um, that is um, the concept of sight, the concept of equality, and of course, the concept of the number thousand. Um, instead, we can just use it as a symbol. That means symbolic knowledge then is um, specific, specific to the limited human mind, which relies on, which always relies on the mediation of science, um, and we use it almost always and everywhere, as Leibniz says. At the same time, this form of knowledge is um, deficient and prone to error, um, because precisely because we operate operate with uh, concepts we do not fully grasp. And this is also why Leibniz um, speaks of blind knowledge. The second step in our short historical uh, overview is Wolf. Um, Wolf introduces in his uh, German works the German translation for um, the distinction cognitio symbolica and, and uh, cognitio intuitiva. Um, I can present you with an English translation. Um, but obviously that kind of misses the point. Uh, anyway, um, for it is to be noted that words are the reason of a special kind of knowledge, which we call the figurative. For we either represent things themselves or by words or other signs. The first knowledge is called the intuitive knowledge, unshown erkenntnis. Uh, the other is the figurative knowledge, figurliche erkenntnis. So um, the translation for um, cognitio intuitiva is unchound and for uh, cognitio uh, symbolica uh, figurlich. Um, especially this last translation is um, strange for at least two reasons, I would argue. Um, first, because figure is also a, a loan word, a Latin loan word in, uh, in German. So why not just stick with um, symbolish? Um, and um, second, because obviously not all signs uh, are figure. F uh, Figures are um, already are a special case of science, so to speak. Yeah. Anyway, um, Wolf, however, does not only provide the German translation, but also makes um, a crucial shift in content. And I think the differences to Leibniz are quite striking. Um, for Wolf, humans are also capable of um, intuitive knowledge. They are capable of both forms of knowledge. Um, intuitive knowledge now means um, that we have the idea of this thing, that we represent the things themselves, as he says. Um, that means that intuitive knowledge now becomes um, sort of an everyday form of knowledge. We have, for example, intuitive knowledge when, we, um, when a thing is presented to our senses. In symbolic knowledge, um, on the other hand, we do not represent the thing itself, but only use signs. We need symbolic knowledge uh, whenever um, our intuitive knowledge is incomplete or impossible. Um, for example, when the um, thing we presented is not present to us right now, um, or when we are dealing with uh, general concepts. That means that symbolic knowledge is a vital form uh, for Wolf as well as for Leibniz, um, but for for a different reason, so to say, um, because we already uh, we also have access to the um, intuitive knowledge. Um, Wolf thus draws the distinction between intuitive and symbolic knowledge not between gods and humans, or gods and mortals, or whatever, but within human knowledge. And this is a, a significant shift in in meaning, I would say. Um, there is also no reference to simultaneousness as in Leibniz. Um, however, there is a strong connection to sensuality and especially to visuality. And that is what Jens just addressed um, in the Q&A. Um, yes. OK, that finally brings me to, to Lambert. Um, Lambert's philosophical reflections on symbolic knowledge can be found in his uh, new organon, especially in part three, semiotics in which he develops a theory of science. Lambert um, expands on Wolf's concept of knowledge. 
he has a similar understanding of the distinction as Wolf, but with an empiricist twist, so to speak. And this is uh, mainly, I would say, because he's uh, heavily influenced by, by Locke. Um, for Lambert, symbolic knowledge plays a crucial epistemological role, um, or as he puts it, it is an indispensable aid of thinking. So there, there even is, um, one could go so far and say there is no thinking without symbols. Um, without science, we would be subject to a stream of fading sensations, he says. We can only form clear concepts based on um, sensation, on the sensation of the represented thing. Uh, we can, however, use science instead um, to operate with concepts of uh, things that are not present to us uh, at the moment. Science, um, as for Wolf, serves as um, substitutes uh, for, for Leibniz as well, um, for cases in which we do not have access to the thing itself. In Lambert's words, the science reminds us, um, the sign reminds us of the concept of which we are not clearly aware without sensation, but which we can recognize as soon as the sensation is renewed. This is all that we represent when, without renewing sensation, we think of the concept red, white, green, etc., of the third, fourth, fifth octave, etc., of sweet, bitter, sour, etc. Lambert has an extremely broad understanding of science. Uh, almost anything can be a sign, words, sounds, figures, and so on. Um, the signs differ, however, in um, with respect to their expressiveness. Um, more often than not, uh, signs are not perfect substitutes for the concepts they uh, represent. Um, for example, the word red does not um, provide us with a sensation of um, the color red, um, obviously. And the sign lacks um, the clearness of the thing itself, um, one could say. This is, um, according to Lambert, uh, not always um, the case, though. Um, think, of, for example, about uh, drawing a triangle. Um, as imperfect as uh, the drawing may be, it still serves as a sign for triangle, and it also um, provides us with a clear concept. Um, that means figures, um, geometric figures, have a unique status for Lambert, and uh, that is because the movement with which we draw the figures is completely with, without, uh, within our control and beat uh, the movements of our hands if we draw a triangle or even uh, imaginary movements um, when we draw triangles in our uh, own imagination. In Lambert's words, um, uh, yeah, this is also um, the, uh, the basis for the um, certainty and for the achievements or for the success of um, geometry um, as um, um, Lambert points out, um, it was easy to, uh, for Euclid to give definitions and define the use of his words. He could put lines, angles, and figures in front of the eyes and thus directly connect words, concepts, and things. The word was only the name of the thing and because one could see it before one's eyes, one could not doubt the possibility of the concept. In short, in geometry, the thing itself, its concept, and its sign all fall into one. Thus, when we do a triangle, we have produced the thing itself, so to speak. Much could be said about the role of um, symbols in Lambert's um, philosophy of science, but I want to focus on a, um, on a point that is um, more relevant to my main thesis now. And uh, this is the idea of a form of knowledge that is exclusively sign-based. Um, that means that it lacks a thing it represents altogether. Um, for Leibniz, um, this was um, a form of blind knowledge that was in uh, imminent danger, um, <laughs> so to speak. Um, Lambert is also aware of um, the risks of such empty signs. Um, he speaks of um, empty sounds, um, words without uh, symbols, without content are empty sounds, and the system of such words um, is nothing but uh, empty word stuff. And he's thinking about um, scholastic uh, philosophy, by the way. Um, but on the other hand, um, Lambert repeatedly points out the potential or the power of this form of knowledge, especially in his letter to Kant, from which I draw um, my title, like I said. And now I present you the, um, the whole 
quotation. We have in symbolic knowledge an intermediate instrument between sensation and pure thinking, Lambert writes to Kant. No one has yet formed himself a clear representation of all the members of an infinite series, and no one is going to do so in the future. But we are able to do arithmetic with such series to give their sums and so on by virtue of the laws of symbolic knowledge. We thus extend ourselves far beyond the borders of our actual thinking. The sign square root of minus one represents an unthinkable non-thing, and yet it can be used very well in finding theorems. Symbolic knowledge thus allows us to denote the conceptual impossible, one could say. And this is because the expressive power of language goes far beyond the range of possible concepts. It is only subject to certain rules of um, construction. Um, that means that the sign has to be well formed in, in modern terms. Semantically, such a sign has no meaning. Um, it does not represent a thing, but a thing impossible in itself, as Lambert puts it, a non-thing, a non-ends. Or ends imaginarium, he gives a whole list of different expressions. Um, thus, for Lambert, symbolic knowledge goes hand in hand with an extension of um, the space of possibility. Um, we have in Lambert um, the two realms of logical possibility and real possibility, real possibility that we all already find in, in Leibniz and later in Wolf, um, with totally um, different. Um, conception, but um, <laughs> they are there, uh, so to say. And now Lambert adds a third form of possibility, which he calls um, symbolic possibility. And the only criterion for um, this form of possibility is syntactic well-formedness. OK, this brings um, me finally back to um, the theory of uh, parallel lines and to the last part of my talk. Um, my thesis is, as I mentioned earlier, that um, the two methods of proceeding that Lambert represents in the theory of um, parallel lines, um, namely Euclid's method and his own purely symbolical method, um, correspond to this um, distinction between intuitive knowledge and symbolic knowledge. Um, what do, do I mean by this? Um, the method Lambert ascribes to Euclid depends on the idea of the thing itself, which is exactly Wolf's wording for intuitive knowledge. Um, Lambert vigorously defends Euclid's method as justified, but it has an important flaw, and uh, you can probably already guess what this flaw is. It is um, the um, parallel axiom. Um, the intuitive method fails to provide a rigorous proof for the parallel axiom because the representation of the thing itself uh, cannot provide its universal possibility. Um, and that is why Lambert um, attempts a symbolic proof in the first place, because he's not too happy with um, the rigor of geometry. Although, uh, like I said, he, he defends um, Euclid's method also um, compared to um, contemporary um, proof attempts. Now, Lambert's own proof is um, symbolic in two respects, I, I want to argue. Um, first, um, it does not depend on, on intuition, which is um, a purely negative criterion. Um, but I think um, there was more to it. Um, in the second respect, um, this proof can be considered um, symbolic in the sense that it is based on empty or blind symbolic knowledge. His proof starts with a hypothetical assumption of, um, from Lambert's points of view, unthinkable non-things, um, the so-called Lambert quadrilaterals. Here we see a <laughs> Lambert quadrilateral, um, the quadrilateral A, B, C, D. Um, these are quadrilaterals um, of which three of the angles are right angles, and the fourth angle is 90 degrees in Euclidean geometry and smaller or larger than 90 degrees in hyperbolic or spheric um, geometry. Um, and these uh, three variants of the Lambert quadrilateral now corresp correspond to the three hypotheses Lambert introduces in his theory of parallel lines. For Lambert, the non-Euclidean figures, the non-Euclidean variants of the Lambert quadrilaterals are unthinkable because because they contradict the parallel axiom, which is undoubtfully true in Lambert's eyes. Therefore, they must be logically impossible. They can, however, be represented symbolically. In this regard, they um, fulfill a similar function um, 
to the imaginary numbers in quadratic equations. They can be used to derive theorems, or in this case, a contradiction, hopefully, um, although they are unthinkable to the human intellect. Um, and this has an interesting um, implication, and that is the last point I want to make before um, I will wrap up my talk. Um, technically, this um, Lambert quadrilaterals are not even geometric figures in the strict sense, um, at least um, in the context of Lambert's own understanding of geometric figures. They may appear so at, uh, at first glance, um, but for Lambert, they are clearly not. Geometrical figures um, are characterized, as I pointed out earlier, by the fact that the thing itself, the concept, and the corresponding sign coincide. However, however, this cannot be the case with the Lambert quadrilaterals, at least not with the non-Euclidean variants, because they are only empty signs. They do not have any semantic contact. They do not represent a concept, and um, they can't be realized um, as a thing itself. And if you look closely, we see that uh, one of the sides of the rect uh, rectangle is marked by a dashed line. Um, and I would argue that um, this is Lambert's way of um, indicating, indicating that he's not um, depicting um, geometric figure figures, but only um, symbols for um, impossible figures. To wrap it up, um, what the Lambert quadrilaterals represent is an unthinkable non thing in Lambert's words. Um, they are neither real nor logically possible, but only symbolically possible. A non-Euclidean Lambert um, quadrilateral is therefore not a um, geometric figure, but only a sign or symbol. And in this sense, um, Lambert's failed proof attempt can be considered symbolically. And in this sense, his proof, uh, his proof um, reaches beyond the limits of our thinking, or at least um, beyond uh, the limits of our um, Euclidean thinking, one might add. Um, thank you. Thank you. Right, time for questions. Who wants to begin? Theo, maybe you want to stop the PowerPoint so that we can see each other better. Hanoch, Hanoch Benjamin. Thanks very much. And thanks for the talkers for the former talk, uh, both of uh, which, uh, from both of which I've learned a lot. Uh, I have a couple of questions I'll ask. Uh, one, uh, well, actually, small one at the beginning, and if uh, there's time, I'll uh, come back to other questions. Uh, when you uh, translated the uh, passage from uh, Wolf and also uh, later from uh, Lambert, you used the representation there, represent actually in uh, Wolf. I'm interested in the uh, development of ideas of representation. So I'd like to know what, what's stand be behind for it's translated from German for we either represent things themselves by, or by words uh, or other signs. Is it a Vorstel? Yeah, exactly. Yes. And similarly, um, in the quotation uh, from uh, Lambert, this is all that we represent when without uh, renewing. Yes? Yeah. Also for Lambert, this is always uh, um, the Vorstellung der Sache selbst, the representation of the yes. thing itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it's interesting uh, for me to see whether they use a uh, Forstern as a, their translation of represent, or uh, is it our current translation of uh, Forstern as represent, and they wouldn't uh, identify the Latin word as capturing what they mean. But uh, perhaps this is uh, too far a uh, field now. I don't know. I mean, um, the history of um, of the concepts is um, is uh, very very complicated, obviously very mm -hmm. complex, uh, because there were, um, from Latin there were different variants that that come into play: um, um, conceptus, notio, idea, the the, the Greek. Uh, 
idea, um, which is present uh, in Leibniz, for example. Um, I would uh, understand uh, Vorstellung in Wolf rather as a general term for things we represent in our um, cognition. That is maybe the um, a, a minimal understanding, so to speak, uh, without um, yeah. being in asking danger. To, because, yeah. Sorry, I'm asking also because in earlier philosophy, uh, in the Kant's time the period in which I've worked, you don't see him uh, ascribing using representation to talk about language. And here they use Vorstellung uh, to talk about uh, what words do. So significatio versus a representation is a, that's a distinction for him. That's why I'm asking. That's why I'm really asking this. Okay, uh, that is a good point. And um, to be honest, um, uh, Vorstellung is all, uh, only in the context of uh, Vorstellung uh, der Sache, representation of the thing. When I um, used um, science represent concept, I think that was always my um, <laughs> my uh, work. So I'm not sure if. Um, it can be found uh, to represent can be found in the context of science and the context of word. Um, that was my my expression. I'll stop here. I'm, if if you can, you know, do a quick search and send me yes no, I'd appreciate it. I have other questions, but I'll let others uh, ask first. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. All right. I think Andrea had uh, Andrea had a hand up at some point. Yeah. Very short question. Um, Regarding Lambert's notion of symbolic knowledge, you interpreted it with an syntactic well-formedness. So do you think this is the, a good interpretation because syntactic well-formedness was developed in the 20th century as a terminus technicus? I know, um, of course, this is an anachronistic um, expression, but um, he, he does not use the distinction between syntax and semantic at all. Um, that is that is clear. But I, I th think he has something similar in mind in um, the Anlage zu Architektonik. He, he um, presents uh, different kinds of contradictions. And one example is a contradiction that is um, that occurs in the context of symbolic knowledge. And he gives an exa example, which is um, the word, the made up word, uh, Kugel -eckig, um, which is hard to translate into English. It, it's a combination of Zurich and um, what is the English word? Um, rectangular, maybe? Cornered. Cornered, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, and then he says um, that um, this word uh, does appear to have a meaning, a meaning, but uh, in fact it does not have a meaning. And that is somehow reminiscent, I think, um, of um, the um, example Kana, for example, provides of um, senseless uh, sentences. Um, Caesar is a, is a prime number, for example, which uh, seems um, <laughs> to have. Uh, a meaning, but uh, in fact, doesn't have a meaning because it's only um, well formed in a syntactic sense. But yeah, um, you're right. Um, the expression was was my expression. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, yes, um, I have a, my question concerns the notion that you suggested of as an unthinkable no thing uh, with respect to the role of uh, alchemy in this whole debate about uh, the nature of symbolization. Uh, I was somewhat surprised that there was no mention of this relationship between alchemy and other symbol systems. Uh, would you have any comments on that? No, I don't think so. I'm afraid I don't. I don't have any any con uh, comment. Um, I don't know how. Um, to what extent Lambert's um, refers to to uh, Archimedes? I'm I'm really not sure. I have to confess. I have to look that up. Um, the prime example um, in the context of geometry always is Euclid for for Lambert. 
the reason it comes to mind to me is because Kant had a very negative attitude towards uh, alchemy and and uh, dismissed it, uh, it certainly in his earlier writings. So anyway, thank you. Ah, uh, sorry, I um, I. Uh... I was thinking about Archimedes, uh, alchemy, of course. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, I um, I don't think there was connection to to alchemy for Lambert. I mean, this um, uh, notion of of symbolic is um, epistemological. It's clearly epistemological for for Lambert, and um, and that regard, he's in, in the tradition of of um, of Leibniz and. Um, and Wolf with a, uh, which is a different um, tradition than um, that tradition that goes uh, back far further um, uh, and which is um, uh, not only uh, epistemological in the strict sense, I would say. Thank you. Vincenzo? Uh, well, I, uh, I thank you very much, Theo. I, I, I just wanted to uh, 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 ask a follow-up of, of Andrea's question, that is to say whether you may explain a bit more what kind of symbolic possibility, I mean, how would you work with symbolic possibility conceived as well-formedness with diagrams? That is to say, that there could be impossible diagrams according to Leib uh, 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 Lambert as opposed to possible diagrams which are possible just symbolically. I mean, uh, how, how could we apply this syntactic notion of one formedness, not, not to, to, to algebra or, or language, but to, uh, to diagrams themselves with dotted lines or, or, or whatever? That is what have you in mind here exactly? Mm. Thank you. Uh, that is a very good question, I think. Um, <laughs> um, like I said, I think um, we can't understand um, the Lambert quadrilaterals as uh, geometric diagrams in the strict sense, because when they were uh, diagrams in the strict sense, they would, um, um, would have to be constructible um, on the basis of um, definitions and postulates and so on. And the Lambert quadrilaterals are, um, to Lambert at least, um, clearly not. Um, they can't be constructed um, based on the Euclidean postulates. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have um, the problem with the parallel axiom. So they, um, this was my argument that they can't be um, diagrams. Um, now, how is it possible to, or at least not geometric diagrams, but of course, this is only my distinction now. Um, so the question would be, um, what are the rules to construct um, non-geometric diagrams? Or what are the rules to construct um, signs in general, or symbols in general? And I would say um, this can only be um, <laughs> in the tradition of, of an as combinatoria, the also old idea of, of combining different um, different concepts. There can't be any any postulates uh, involved here for for Lambert. That's that is for sure. But we are able to um, to combine different different concepts, um, like in the example of um, Kugel Eckig, which do not. Um, which are not, which is a word which uh, can't describe any any real thing because because Kugel Eck is uh, neither logically possible nor real possible. But we are able to um, to connect um, the different symbols of the different words, so to speak. But he doesn't. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, he doesn't elaborate on on uh, the rules that are present in the construction of science. I think. Yeah. We also have a question uh, in the chat, but Dennis, maybe you want to read it or operate on it verbally. Um, sure. Um, so I want to ask if uh, Lambert in his discussion connects the issue of uh, indirect and direct proofs to uh, the, the distinction you are focusing on between intuitive and symbolic knowledge. Uh, now, in the proof of the parallel axioms, uh, the, from your description, it appears that he's trying to prove by reductio of uh, the, the non-Euclidean alternatives uh, geometries, um, uh, and uh, he doesn't have a direct proof. And but from 
just from my impression of you talking about it, it just, that he wasn't thinking that it was a, such a possible. Now, um, now, if that is the case, uh, some, pro I mean, some propositions such as the parallel axiom could only be proved uh, via such uh, a proof method, so indirectly via reductio. So then there would be indirect proofs that are never eliminable in favor of direct proofs. So that's whether he notices that he's committed to such a thing when uh, uh, making this uh, argument, because that was an issue that uh, uh, in the 17th century, uh, changing proofs that, that were indirect in geometry to direct proofs was a uh, research uh, issue that Paul Monkos talks about it in an earlier book, uh, later history of it, I'm not uh, much uh, aware of uh, for myself, but I was wondering whether Lambert sees that connection. Um, thank you. Um, I thought about that uh, a lot when I, I was preparing my talk. Um, Lambert has a whole um, chapter on indirect proofs and his um, new organon, um, but there is no connection to, to symbols or to symbolic knowledge. Um, but it, um, it absolutely makes sense because um, the indirect proof is, a, is an obvious place to, um, to apply this form of, of empty symbolic knowledge because um, um, in the best case, it is, um, is it, it is canceled out and it can't, be, can't uh, do any harm there. So uh, um, I would totally agree. It does make sense to um, to use indirect proof in, in the connection um, with uh, symbolic knowledge, but I unfortunately haven't found a, a direct evidence. Hello. Thanks very much. If no one uh, who hasn't asked, uh, okay. Uh, I have uh, two questions of detail about uh, the interpretation. One from... Uh, of the passage from uh, Lambert's uh, letter to Kant. Um, he talks uh, both about the uh, infinite series and uh, the square root of minus one. I, I read it again and now it seems to me that uh, he uh, addresses two extensions there. It's not that there is a contradiction in the infinite series of the kind he thinks there is in the square root of uh, minus one. So uh, we can uh, extend our thought with symbols, both beyond what is actually uh, calculable, imaginable, thinkable, and to uh, uh, useful uh, non-things, which are uh, means to prove things about other things as we do with the imaginary numbers. Uh, would you agree with this uh, interpretation? Uh, in short, yes, uh, that are two different um... Extension. Application cases of uh, symbolic knowledge, so to say, yes. Two different kinds of extension beyond what can actually yeah. be uh, thought. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing, and here I'm not sure I understood you, um, uh, which uh, you uh, read when uh, when you read the Anlagets uh, or Architectonic Section 12 of Lambert's. There, if I understood you correctly, and perhaps I didn't. Uh, you saw word, concept, and thing as a, a unity. Um, and you mentioned it later. But uh, here, I know I'm reading, reading it again. Uh, it's easier to see them all as uh, existing in uh, one uh, act or occasion than to see them as one and the same thing. Because Euclid, defines, uh, let's say, kinds of triangle. And words are certainly not uh, triangles. And the concept of the triangle, uh, you know, let's say a right angle triangle, is uh, beyond the specific right angle triangle, which is there. So you have the thing, namely the specific right angled triangle drawn. You have the concept and you have the word which I've used here, the phrase right angle triangle, and the <coughs> three of them are different, although uh, existing in the same uh, act or occasion. Mm. Um, I think I, I like this clarification because it, um, 
um, it has a connection with this um, um, constructive constructivist view that Dumbart um, has um, in that um, um, geometry, the certainty of geometry is based on, on a form of movement, which all, uh, almost sounds um, Kantian in a way. Um, but um, the important thing for Lambert is that we are able to um, to produce um, the concept, the thing um, ourselves. We can't do that with um, signs, with words, um, uh, with a word for um, um, whatever uh, perception, uh, the color green, for example. We can use it as a word, but we can't reproduce um, the thing itself, and we can't reproduce a clear um, a clear concept of this word. But we can do that with figures. But of course, um, uh, there is an um, we have to fulfill the act of, of, of drawing the triangle. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have to move forward. But before that, let's thank Theo for this talk and thank move you. to the third and last uh, talk in our panel, uh, which is by Angela, Andrea Reichenberger. I'm sorry. Uh, and the title is What is the Meaning of Possible in Euclid's Geometry, Kant, Kessner, and the Controversy over Consistency and Existence? Andrea, you have the floor. Um, can you see my um, slides? Yes, perfect. Maybe you want to make them full screen? Um, wait a minute. <laughs> No hurry. Okay. So you can see and um, the slides and hear me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, the title of my talk is What is the Meaning of Possible in Euclid's Geometry, Kant, Kasten, and the Controversy over Real Possibility? To this day, there is an ongoing controversy about the question whether Kant's doctrine of the synthetic a priori status of mathematical knowledge has been refuted by the development of non Euclidean geometries. Within a plethora of arguments for and against Kant, relatively little attention has been paid to Kant's theory of possibility with regard to the proof concept. My aim is to shed light on this topic by focusing on a debate between Immanuel Kant and Gotthelf Abraham Kessner. Here is the content of my talk. I will give a short introduction, then go further to Abraham Gotthelf Kessner's question, what is the meaning of possible in Euclid's geometry? Then I want to argue that Kant was uh, replying to uh, that Kastner was replying to Kant, then I will focus on Kant's distinction regarding possibility within geometry, um, the, the discussion or shed a short light on the historical background, the parallel postulate and given outlook. Um, as well known, Kant's core thesis in the Critique of Poor Reason is that mathematic judgments are synthetic a priori, providing new knowledge not derived from experience. This becomes part of his overall argument for transcendental idealism. That is, he argues that the possibility of experience depends on certain necessary conditions, which, which he calls a priori forms, and that these conditions structure and hold true for our perceptual world of experience. Now, according to the standard reading, Kant's doctrine um, has been refuted by the development of non euclidean geometries. However, as also well known, against this common few a plethora of arguments has been presented in order to save Kant. And, it, um, and this is the, the historical, um, huge background, um, which I want to pick up now and um, 
Kant's core thesis in a short paper. It's called uh, "What is Was heißt in Euclid's Geometrie möglich?" Um, what is the possible mean? What does possible mean in Euclid's geometry? And um, after the publication of the second edition of Kant's critique, uh, Johann August Eberhard, one of the main critiques of Kant, organized a campaign against the neo transcendental philosophy. He founded two periodicals, the Philosophisches Archiv and the Philosophisches Magazin. And Abraham Gottwald Kessner wrote um, several articles for Eberhard's Philosophisches Magazin. And one of these articles um, was uh, this one, was heißt in Euclid's Geometrie möglich? Um, just very short for your information. The other articles are uh, über den mathematischen Begriff des Raumes, about the mathematical concept of space, über die geometrischen Axiome, about the geometrical axioms, and last but not least, über Kunstwörter, besonders in der Mathematik. And um, these are summarized in Kästner's well-known book, Mathematische Anfangsgründe, Volume 1. Let's have a look at uh, the beginning of um, Kästner's article um, on possible in Euclid's geometry. At the beginning, Kessner refers to the first three postulates in uh, Euclid's um, geometry. Euclid's elements start with a list of definitions of the mathematical terms which will be used. And after the definition in book one, there are five postulates and five common notions. In general, any proposition is proved using only the postulates and common notions and the previous propositions. Mm. Traditional Euclidean geometry begins, so to say, with a number of first axioms, but it is crucial to mention that um, in fact, Euclid did not employ the term axiom, but choose instead uh, the word itemata, um, which is commonly translated as postulates in English. And it's very interesting to see that Kant, Kessner also refers to the postulates in the elements as itemata and not as axioms. And my aim is not to talk about Euclid himself and the long history of his reception, but just to focus on um, Kessner's reception. And it's interesting that he just focuses on the first three postulates at the beginning of his articles. And um, now the first postulate uh, Kessner formulates as follows. Um, it states, von jedem Punkt nach jedem Punkt eine gerade Linie zu ziehen, um, in English, according to my translation, to draw a straight line from any point to any point. The postulate two is, jede begrenzte gerade Linie, so weit man will, zu verlängern. So my um, translation is to extend a finite straight line arbitrarily or, or as far as you like, as um, the German word, so weit man will, in a straight line. And the third postulate, um jeden Mittelpunkt mit einem Halbmesser einen Kreis zu beschreiben, to describe a circle with any center and distance uh, with a radius. The a crucial point is that according to Kästner's first thesis is that the first three postulates should be read as if they began um, with the words, it is possible. For example, um, postulate one asserts that it's possible to draw a straight line from any point to any point. And in general, that means within the axiomatic methods, um, postulates were uh, presupposed and um, this is a kind of postulated possibility Kantner um, maintains. Uh, can, uh, Kessner maintains. And from this kind of possibility, Kessner distinguishes a second kind of possibility. On the basis of the postulates, theorems are derived. And this method 
um, is based on another kind of possibility, namely on provable possibility. Uh, for example, it is possible to construct an literal triangle on a given finite straight line. This is a provable proposition. A provable possibility understood in this way uh, presupposes the criterion of contrad contradiction-free possibility, says Kessner. According to Kessner, to prove possibilities and um, consequently to show that they are necessary propositions is always a matter of reason. The crucial question is reason completely without intuition or what's the relationship between reason and intuition here? And this was a problem Kastner was struggling with it. And he asked himself, or in the text, aber woher weiß man nun, dass kein Widerspruch vorhanden ist? But how do we know now that there is no contradiction? And he says again, um, sicherlich ist dazu nicht genug, dass man keinen sieht. Surely it's not enough that one does not see one. And now, I quote Kastner, he says, nun schließt man aus, nie schließt man aus dem Bilde, sondern aus dem, was der Verstand bei dem Bilde denkt. One never concludes from the picture or image alone, but um, from um, the intellect or mind, the Verstand, um, what the intellect or mind Verstand, reason, thinks while seeing the picture. Before I um, conclude with an um, outlook and um, against the historical background a discussion of the parallel postulate, I will present Immanuel Kant's distinction because um, Kessner was um, directly um, struggling with Kant's distinction here. Um, it was clear that um, Kant um, had two, for Kessner, that Kant had two concepts of possibilities, two notions of possibility, logical and real possibility. Um, here a famous um, Kant quotation, that's in the concept of a figure, um, that is enclosed between two, I'm sorry, I have just here on my slides, the, okay, I have found it, I cannot read it in the, because the, the, I can't see the full picture, I'm sorry. Now, thus in the concept of a figure that is enclosed between two straight lines, there is no contradiction for the concept of two straight lines and their intersection contain no negation of a figure. Rather, the impossibility rests not on the concept in itself, but on its construction and space, that means, on the conditions of space and its determinations. But these in turn have the objective reality. That means they pertain to possible things because they contain in themselves a, a priori the form of experience in general. Kant is operating here with two notions of possibility, logical possibility given by the conditions of thought alone, or to quote in German, analytische Bedingungen des Denkens, and real possibility given by the conditions of thought plus intuition. One might say, therefore, the logical possibility without real is an empty concept without content. For logical possibility, freedom from contradiction is a necessary and sufficient criterion. However, real possibility never results merely from the non-contradiction according to Kant. Real possibility has to be proven by, I quote in German, the ihm correspondierende Anschauung a priori.
In German, here, he, um, a quotation which makes this clear a little bit better how um, Kant applies this distinction um, to a gleichschenkliches um, triangle. But uh, because of reasons of time, I want to go um, further here. Um, as well known, Euclid's postulate, first postulate um, cannot be proven as a theorem. Also, this was attempted by many people. Um, at the time when um, Kastner and Kant wrote um, their works, Euclid himself used only the first four postulates for the first 28 propositions and the elements, but was forced to invoke the parallel postulates and the uh, 29s. Also well known, in 1823, Janos Balai and Nikolai Lobachevsky independently realized that entirely sized, consistent non Euclidean geometries could be created in which the parallel postulate did not hold. And Gauss had also discovered but suppressed the existence of non Euclidean geometries. Most of those of Sacharides and Kant contemporaries working on a parallel problem, like Sacheri himself, in fact, really thought that they had shown that the fifth postulate does follow from the remain of Euclid's axiom. And all of them were attempting, like Sacheri, to find such a proof. This is evidenced by the dissertation of Kessner student, Georg Simon Klügel, a dissertation which collected all of the available attempts to prove the parallel postulates, 28 in all, and showed that each of these proofs were um, in a, inadequate uh, because they that were not able to um, prove what they wanted to prove. Today, we know, of course, that Sahir's attempt actually failed to do what it was meant to do, and that what is actually did was proof that non-Euclidean geometries are possible after all. Kessner was well acquainted with all this discussion. And this might be one reason why he was openly skeptic about the possibility to prove Euclid's parallel postulate. But if you just look on his um, paper, what um, possible means in Euclid's geometry, then it becomes also quite clear that um, if we state that the parallel postulate is an axiom and um, axioms are just postulated and cannot be proven, then this was another, this was an argumentation for Kessner to say, um, yeah, um, we are. Um, we have a good reasons to think that uh, the parallel postulate is not an um, is uh, not uh, provable um, if we postulate it as an axiom. But um, this is not the point I want to go into detail. But I want to show the historical background of this debate before the non-Euclidean geometry. And it was um, Kant who uh, wrote and published under the name of a student, Johann Schulz, a reply to Kastner. And in this reply, Kant argued that mathematical propositions are synthetic a priori. And this is uh, the reason why Kastner was unable to prove the parallel postulate. Um, this claim uh, was in this um, discussion till today um, against the background of the concept of possibility within uh, geometry. Um, I think it's um, um, very useful to come to the summary that uh, Kastner and Kant had uh, two different uh, concepts of possibility in mind um, when they discuss what possible means in geometry. And what I've done is to 
um, I hope that I have be able to make clear that Kastner distinguished between a presupposed possibility referring to itemata or postulates and provable possibility referring to theorems. Regarding the case of provable possibility in geometry, Kessner, and this is uh, crucial for his argumentation, possibility coincides with reality or better to say with Wirklichkeit, as we say in, in German. That means for Kessner, and this he explicitly states in his paper, there is no difference between logical and real possibility. Whereas for Kant, in geometry, logical possibility has to be distinguished from real possibility. Because real possibility cannot be based on um, the principle of contradiction alone, we need construction in intuition. Now, um, for um, Kastner, the, uh, the, the criterion of um, constructiveness was well important, was very important as well. The crucial question is what means um, constructivity uh, in Kastner's works? It seems to me that Kastner was highly skeptical regarding um, Kant's notion of intuition a priori. In any case, there was a disagreement as to whether demonstrable mathematical judgments follow I'm sorry. Um, um, demonstrable mathematical judgments follow from the synthetic principles via strictly logical or conceptual inference, and so in strict accordance with only the principle of contradiction, or whether they are deduced via inferences that are themselves brilliant on intuition. But which do not violate the law of contradiction. I think this is an open question. This is the end of my talk. So, thank you. Thank you. Very good timing, thank you for these two. So we have plenty of time for questions, interventions. Who wants to begin? Des, Des Hogan. Um, yeah, could I just ask you to clarify your final sentence there. Um, there is, of course, a big debate in the Kant literature about whether Kant thinks that the synthetic character of mathematical judgments arises from the fact that the axioms are synthetic um, and merely from that fact, or whether he thinks uh, mathematical judgments are synthetic because the proof steps can also be synthetic and um, the, the, um, the, the, the main evidence for the first view is the paragraph on B14, where he says uh, that the mathematical inferences all proceed nach dem Satz des Widerspruchs, right? And it sounds as though the, the inferences are all analytic in that way and just the axioms are synthetic. When you said it was an open question, I didn't understand whether you were talking about uh, an open question regarding the interpretation of Kant or an open question in the philosophy of mathematics. <laughs> Um, no, um, 
I want to say regarding the debate between Kant and Kastner. Um, for me, the, we have a lot of literature on, on Kant, but not on Kastner. And I'm more interested uh, to uh, Kastner's position, but um, it uses also the term construction, but not uh, in this sense as uh, Kant did. And uh, for me, it was more a question regarding to Kastner's position, yeah. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm really not sure how this um, Kastner's paper should be read. And this was more a question for you and for the audience, because we have um, one interpretation in the literature, which, argues that Kant, uh, that Kastner was criticizing um, Kant and that he was more strictly speaking a poor rationalist, if you want to use this word rationalists and um, empiricists and then Kant made the, the great synthesis. But what I'm trying to show is that we have to be very cautious to classify people as poor rationalists or as poor empiricists. And um, Kastner, it seems to me, was skeptical regarding um, intuition. Um, but on the other hand, he was not a poor rationalist. So, and um, yeah, it, I, I discussed this point with Jens a little bit more because according to Jens, he thinks that uh, um, Kastner was highly skeptical uh, using diagrams, using um, graphical demonstrations um, in um, proof theory, so to say. Uh, but yeah, the, this is right. Uh, Kant uh, criticizes the use of pictures, as he says, um, of, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, of um, tools beyond the um, poor reason, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, but Kessner is very un unclear what um, in these pictures or diagrams means. And um, it's not the same as an, a critique of um, intuition a priori, because intuition a priori should not be identified with just visuality or diagrammatic tools. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is my position. So coming Thank back you. to your question, though, um, it was really in, um, meant not just for philo philosophy of mathematics as a whole, or not just focusing on Kant itself, but on the, the debate between uh, Kant and Kessner. Thank you. Vincenzo? Yes, so thank you very much. I, I, I also would like to ask something about, uh, well, again, about uh, 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 axioms and definitions. Uh, uh, I have the impression that Kessner considered the parallel postulate to be an axiom, in fact, rather than a postulate. He, he, he lists it among the, 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 the axioms in his big treatise on, on, on geometry. And, and also in those treatises from, from the 1790s uh, on, on the Philosophisches Magazine, at, at some point he, he says that uh, we probably failed in obtaining a, a proof of the parallel postulate since we do not have a good definition of a straight line. And, uh, and uh, also in, in, the, in, the, in the preface to the Klugel dissertation, he says that we are not able to, to, to prove the parallel postulate because we have no, uh, not the analysis situs by Leibniz and therefore good definitions. So I, I, I have the impression that he was looking more for, for definitions of say straight line or, or parallel lines in order to, 
prove the parallel postulate as an axiom from those definitions rather than, than conceiving it as an existential uh, uh, statement or, or, or a constructive thing like, uh, like the other axioms, uh, uh, sorry, like the other postulates, the, uh, the first three postulates. Is, is this, is this right? I, I mean, I, I... Yeah, I absolutely agree. So because of reasons of time, I, um, I just want to concentrate on the possibility notion in Kersner. But um, what makes him more unrationalist than counsel to say is that he um, clearly had this position you summarized here that uh, for him, um, the definitions of concepts was were more important than um, construction in intuition. And um, this is based on the Leibnizian tradition um, of, of logic, to, so to say, and um, how we prove um, things. And um, yeah, it's, I think very important and what distinguishes uh, Kant from Kessner. And this is also a reason why he was highly skeptical um, regarding the concept of pictures, of using pictures in, um, in proofs, yeah. Mm. The, the, the other thing you mentioned is, um, yeah, the relationship between Kessner and Euclid. So um, Kessner was not interested to um, interpret Euclid in um, an adequate sense in, in, in a kind of uh, Euclid exegese. Um, he was interpreting Euclid for his purposes, so to say. And um, this had the consequence that Kessner, on the other hand, um, picks up words Euclid uses like itemata, but then equates it with um, axioms yeah, and um, does not clearly distinguish. So very typical for that term. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have other questions, comments? Well, uh, Jerry Chandler. Since, since we have a bit of time, I would just like to make a comment uh, on the, uh, my summary view of the three talks. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the three authors because they really did a very fine job of uh, presenting their materials and I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, it, it's good. But my comment is uh, regard to the relationship between synthesis and analysis as uh, mentioned particularly by Newton uh, in where he suggested that analysis preceded synthesis. Uh, this is in his, uh, I believe, in one of his uh, papers about 1803 on optics. Uh, but the issue here is, uh, for me, the relationship between analysis and synthesis as used in mathematics and such as geometry versus the diagrammatic forms of analysis and synthesis. Uh, certainly, or it appears to me, and others may wish to comment, but the science of physics and the philosophy of physics seem to be focused uh, on entirely the, if you would, the Euclidean view of the world, uh, that the synthesis of, of uh, conclusions and diagrams from the laws of physics are based on the axioms of physics, if you would, or the axioms of geometry or some such notion of, of mentation. Uh, the, on the other side of the coin is the notion of analysis in chemistry leading to uh, diagrams of chemical structures. Uh, now, the methods of chemistry are such 
that developed uh, long after Newton and Leibniz are such that synthesis from the elements is necessary to establish the structures, the structural diagrams. So uh, I think the three talks together are pretty clear on how at least in part, the logic of chemistry is separate and distinct from the logic of physics based on the relative roles of analysis and synthesis and the consequential diagrams from the antecedent analysis. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Any of the panelists want to comment on this? Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks a lot. This was an, um, um, a huge picture, what you were presenting with um, um, a lot of um, I, um, possibilities to broaden the perspective, so to say. And um, what we have done in our three talks, just to focusing on very specific uh, um, topics and authors, and um, you try to... Uh, contextualize it in a much more broader uh, context, which would be very interesting, but I'm afraid I don't think we have to turn the discussion a little bit more, but I want to think about it, yeah, because um, especially Kessner, as you know, was um, well acquainted with uh, the developments in physics at this time too, yeah. I, I might add to the comment that, uh, well, the other two speakers, I would also enjoy your, your yeah, yeah. comments if, if you have because further comments. Perhaps Jens and Theo will also say a few words. It was just from my perspective. Well, I, I, I would say that, uh, well, that the history of the concepts of analysis and uh, synthesis are very well, very, very difficult, and it depends a, a lot on in which area, also in the 18th century, we are looking on. Uh, so, well, uh, what, what, what I, or what, what comes to my mind is that analysis is uh, mainly uh, coming from the philosophy of science of the 18th century, something like, um, well, like like uh, going up, like a like a bottom up method, so to say. Whereas uh, synthesis is often uh, used as a top down method. Uh, well, but sometimes even this perspective changes, uh, turns turns completely around, so to say, and therefore it de uh, de depends a lot on the authors, uh, which you look like. And the other way, if you, if you, uh, as as far as I I read from. Uh, well, from the chat, um, you see you're interested in the relation between mathematics and chemistry uh, and also using these terms. Uh, I, I keep in mind that, um, well, at the end of the 18th century, a lot of authors, also Kant and so on, uses these terms like analysis and synthesis, like uh, um, um, using this uh, chemistry uh, processes of, of um, resolving and solving uh, um, elements and so on. And so, well, therefore, there is a connection, I would say. It's a, especially a connection between chemistry and mathematics. I don't know, but it's a, maybe a connection between philosophy and chemistry, so to say. I hope that helps a little bit, but uh, <laughs> just uh, just some ideas. Yeah. I can, can only uh, agree the history of um, this distinction is, is quite complex, and especially if we um, <laughs> um, add Kant to the story, it um, gets totally different in a way because his uh, his notion of synthesis is a, um, a complete different one than uh, the old um, Euclidean uh, notion of um, synthesis in a in a um, uh, constructive sense, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree that Kant's notion of synthesis is very, very different from the traditional notion. Uh, and the terms go back to Aristotle, as you probably all know. Uh, the only other comment I would make would be that the notion of chemical analysis really uh, started in, in 
the analysis of metals, particularly for making coinage, uh, the stability of gold and silver as being something that was um, durable <laughs> and what, not just transitive. And so that the analysis part of it comes out of the so-called the founding industry of, of uh, preparing pure metals for the uh, uh, cultural, for economic purposes, basically. Uh, this then was expanded uh, analysis, particularly by the alchemists as they tried to find uh, better medicines. And uh, just as a historical fact, the uh, first professor of chemistry was actually in a German university in the School of Medicine to where the analysis of plant materials was of the great concern for the alchemical purposes of therapies. So thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate them, they're quite helpful. Um, thank you. I think that that basically brings us to a close. Um, I would like to thank the speakers tonight for their talks. Let's give them a round thank of applause. You. Uh, and thank you all for taking part in this seminar. We are living through harsh times, so I appreciate even more your presence tonight here. Let's return to the real life, unfortunately. Um, and next week, we are going to have a, a special session of the Princeton Bucharest Seminar, sort of discussion on uh, uh, English poet John Donne. So feel free to drop by if you want to move a bit from philosophy of mathematics to literature. Meanwhile, stay safe and see you at some point. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>